Dragi prijatelji, zadovoljstvo mi je da vam poželim dobrodošlicu na godišnjem memorialnom predavanju u čast profesora Vojna Dimitrijevića, koji je bio jedan od osivača, prvi dugogodišnji direktor Beogradskog centra za ljudska prava. Public intellectual, and you can see an illustration of his public work. But he was also a renowned academic, and for that reason, the Belgrade Center for Human Rights and the uh, friends of Vojn Dimitrievich have over the years kept the tradition to organize a memorial lecture in his honor, which the lecture will always address some pertinent topics of international law or international relations. And because these were the, the areas in which Wojn excelled and which were, uh, with which he uh, dealt with for uh, throughout his academic career and throughout his life. Um, previous memorial lectures brought to Belgrade some of the more, most distinguished international legal scholars. Some of them were also friends of Wojn Dimitrievich and he uh, worked with them or met them in, in the international institutions where he was active or elected or appointed, as the case may be. I could, I could uh, mention, for example, uh, Judge Rosalind Higgins, who uh, is the former president of the International Court of Justice, Professor Christian Tomushat, who was hmm, uh, who is a professor from Berlin and also a former member of the UN Human Rights Committee. Now, today I have the great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this year's memorial lecture, my distinguished colleague Jelena Page. Jelena was an assistant professor of international law and international relations at the Belgrade Law School, at the University of uh, Belgrade Law School in the early 90s. And there she worked directly with Professor Dimitrievich. In the mid 90s, she moved to New York and worked there for the, uh, as it then was known, Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. Today it's called uh, Human Rights First. At that time, she actively participated in the drafting and negotiations of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, the Rome Statute was adopted in 1998. Afterwards, Jelena moved to work in the International Committee uh, of the Red Cross in Geneva as a legal advisor and later on as a senior legal advisor. And in that capacity, she was involved in some of the most pertinent and sensitive issues of human rights and <coughs> humanitarian law during the so-called War on Terror after 9-11. She is also an accomplished scholar, academic writer, and her publications testify about her deep involvement with the pertinent legal issues for example, she wrote about terrorism, about legal regime governing uh, the treatment of the persons detained in the fight against terrorism, then extraterritorial targeting by armed drones, and so forth. The topic of Yelena's lecture today is likewise extremely relevant and will address the questions of international humanitarian law against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine. And before I give the floor to Jelena, let me also say that today's uh, event is also supported by the European Society of International Law. And the lecture and the discussion that will follow are filmed and will be put on the ECIL's website later on. Jelena, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I will stand so that you can see me, but also so that I can see you. I think it's a better idea. 
So um, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, dear friends of the Belgrade Center for Human Rights, Moines, members of Moines family, colleagues, um, ladies and gentlemen, I was extremely honored to have been invited to speak today with you on the topic of international humanitarian law against the backdrop of the conflict in Ukraine. Um, honored simply because I, I've known Boyne for many, many, many years. I had the privilege of him being my professor at law school. As Jenna mentioned, I was later an assistant, um, or rather senior lecturer, I guess, not necessarily assistant professor, at the, um, at the law department, at the International Law Department at Belgrade Law School. And actually, the first article that was ever published um, abroad was an article that was co-authored by Wayne and myself, and it was extremely current at the time. It dealt with sanctions against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. The thing I most remember about Wayne is, of course, it comes out from everything that's been said already, is his integrity. Um, he had integrity, both personal, professional, and political, in very difficult times, as you have just seen. And he serves as, a, as an example to us today um, as well. We continue to follow him um, at the Belgrade Center for Human Rights, and we owe him a great debt of gratitude. So with those words, and hoping that Wayne would have been pleased about the topic, <laughs> at least of today's presentation, um, let me begin. So um, there are many um, branches of international law that are relevant for what is going on in Ukraine today. Two of those branches, however, deal with issues related to the use of force, albeit very differently. One is UN Charter Law, and one is international humanitarian law. The first branch, UN Charter Law, is known as the Jus Ad Bellum, mm -hmm. meaning the law on war, whereas humanitarian law is known as the Jus In Bello, meaning the law in war. Um, for reasons that I will come to in a minute, they have to be very strictly delineated. But I need to say a couple of words, nevertheless, about um, the use in ad bello, meaning UN Charter Law. Um, as we know, the UN Charter in Article 2.4, um, outlining the purposes of the organization, says, among other things, that member states shall not use threat or force um, in relations with other member states when such action is directed against the sovereignty, political independence, or territorial integrity of the other member state. That's a cardinal principle of the Adbelum. There are, however, two exceptions to this principle or to this um, prohibition. The first one is the invocation of individual or collective self-defense by a UN member state after an, an armed, armed attack occurs. And the second um, exception is enforcement action by the UN Security Council. Um, so in this context, there is no doubt that the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation on the 24th of February this year constituted an unlawful use of force under the UN Charter and was um, an act of aggression. There are several definitions of aggression in international law, depending on whether we're talking state act or individual criminal responsibility, but the one most commonly referred to is located or can be found in the 1970 Declaration of the UN General Assembly called the definition of aggression. In several paragraphs, it lists acts that constitute examples of aggression, and the first paragraph says that invasion, military occupation, whether temporary or not, and annexation of territory are um, acts of aggression. Um, in his speech prior to the um, February 24th um, invasion, um, President Putin invoked the right to self-defense um, as a justification under two headings, if I may put it that way, under two headings for the action that was about to be undertaken. On the one hand, he claimed that um, 
Russia is, the Russian Federation is supporting or is about to support the so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk um, based on their invitation. And that therefore the Russian Federation is exercising its right to collective self-defense on behalf of these territories. The problem from the point of view of international law here is that it is very well established that collective self-defense can be exercised only in relation to a state, not to an entity that does not rise to the level of a state. And as we know, these were occupied territories since 2014, which President Putin, um, he recognized their independence a couple of days before um, the invasion, but from a legal point of view, that is essentially null and void. No other country has obviously um, or have recognized the independence of those two republics at the time. The second um, justification within the self-defense um, envelope that was put forward is that Ukraine represents a threat to the Russian Federation because of um, the expansion, I'm paraphrasing, NATO military infrastructure in Ukraine, um, and that therefore there was a threat in fact, to the sovereignty and the very survival of the Russian state. Now, as I've just mentioned, Article 2.4, uh, Article 51 of the Charter says that there's the right to self-defense by a member state of the UN if an armed attack occurs. Now, that language is in the past tense. Needless to say, um, international scholars, and I think, although controversial, it is the prevailing view that states also have the right to um, self-defense in case of the possibility of an immediate attack. In other words, anticipatory self-defense. Now, when that can be exercised again is a whole legal can of worms. But what I'm trying to point to here is that under no, um, no definition of imminence, or immediacy of threat, could it be said that on February 24th, either Ukraine itself or um, NATO or Western countries intended to or were indeed threatening um, an attack on the Russian Federation. And then finally, um, in the, this speech and in others that were uh, have been made over time, there have been also claims of genocide against um, the Russian-speaking population of of Ukraine, or at least those regions, and, um, but the speech of President Putin did not specifically claim that genocide, um, or alleged genocide against these peoples, the Russian-speaking um, communities, constituted a separate basis for intervention. He didn't claim, for example, that the Russian Federation was exercising um, anything akin to humanitarian intervention, which I hasten to add, also remains a very controversial um, concept under international law. Whatever the case may be, the legal reading that indeed aggression occurred on the 24th of February this year was confirmed by UN generally, a, a UN General Assembly resolution that was adopted on March the 2nd this year under the so-called Uniting for Peace mechanism, which can be triggered when the Security Council is unable to act due to stalemate. Um, it has a lot of paragraphs. The first one simply says that the UNGA deplores the aggression that was um, undertaken by the Russian Federation against Ukraine. It, re it demands or requires that Russia cease its use of force against Ukraine and that it immediately, completely, and unconditionally withdraw military forces from Ukraine. As we know, 141 countries voted in favor of this text, five voted against, and 35 abstained. In the meantime, events, have, events are, are rapidly developing. As we know, last week and yesterday and on Monday, um, the Russian parliament uh, after the holding of referenda, alleged referenda, in the four regions under Russian control at the moment, um, determined unanimously, both chambers, that these regions would from now on, or from those days, be incorporated into the Russian 
Federation. The Security Council had before it a resolution condemning the annexation. Um, of course, because of a Russian veto, it was not able to act. And there is an expectation that there will be another UN General Assembly resolution as a result of the stalemate within the UN Security Council. Now, for my own integrity, <laughs> there are two brief points I want to make. The first point is that the use of Bellum, as we all know, sitting in this room, um, is composed of rules of international law, even though they're charter law and should therefore have a very high um, level of respect or, or validity, are often, are simply often violated. That, I mean, that, that's a fact. It, there are political considerations that have and will in the future, and I'm not being cynical, influence the way in which states interpret um, those prohibitions that I've just talked about. <coughs> and the second um, thing that I also need to mention, because I have been wondering about it, is the fact that um, one side to the conflict in Ukraine at the moment, or states supporting Ukraine, have also, particularly since the fall of the Berlin Wall, on several occasions used force without charter authorization, which was unlawful, there was no <coughs> question, um, including that that was obviously um, employed against Serbia. There's absolute, pretty much consensus against international lawyers that this was an unlawful um, breach of the charter. There have been other cases such as Iraq, which was really very blatant, um, the overreaching of the Libya, um, UN Security Council resolution, etc. What I'm trying to say is on the one hand, Abellum is political, and it always will be, and one shouldn't deplore it, that's just the way it is, because we're talking about the center of, of state sovereignty, meaning the use of force in international relations. And then secondly, the actions that preceded this, um, the 24 February events, which I'm not justifying, I hope you understand by any means, undermined the prohibition uh, in, a, in a very um, systematic, systematic way, and there is no recognition of that. So when today people talk about the international rules-based order, I always ask myself, well, what exactly is that? Why are we no longer speaking of international law that is applicable to all? There can't be one order under the outbellum for certain countries and then another order for other countries. That, that's simply not the case, otherwise we may as well say goodbye to the whole charter framework. Sorry, that was a digression, which I perhaps didn't intend to make at such length, but I do feel strongly about it. So we're coming to IHL now, which is international humanitarian law, also known as the law of war, and more rarely referred to as the law, I'm sorry, also known as the law of conflict, and more rarely referred to as the law of war. The main sources of this law are the four Geneva Conventions of 1949, of which I will be mentioning two. The third convention deals with prisoners of war, and the fourth convention deals with the protection of civilians. We also have a treaty additional to those conventions adopted in 1977, the so-called additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions, number one, which is important because in effect, it sets out rules on the conduct of hostilities. We have customary law, and then as customary law, in particularly in the situation of Ukraine, as in other situations of occupation, we have something called the Hague Regulations for Land Warfare um, of 1907. In terms of international humanitarian law, there is no doubt that as a matter of classification, this is an international armed conflict between, on the one hand, the Russian Federation and Ukraine. The question may be asked, what is the nature of the conflict between Ukraine and the regions under Russian control? And um, there's been discussion recently since the, these events happened, and in any event, if a state has non-state entities under its overall control, in that case, the conflict will, as a whole, be considered an international armed conflict. In addition to that, however, as I mentioned, we have had the occupation of Crimea and the two, uh, well, Donetsk and Luhansk since 2014, 
and in the meantime, um, of the other two regions which have been on the table since then, Kherson and Zaporizhia. So under IHL, it is absolutely irrelevant what any state party to an armed international armed conflict calls it, special military operation in this scenario. Um, because the application of IHL and its implementation <coughs> begins as a matter of fact. International armed conflict begins when there is resort to armed force between two or more states. And that's obviously what has happened as a result of the invasion of um, February, um, February 24th. The purpose of the IHL, humanitarian law, is to try, very broadly speaking, is to try as much as possible to limit the effects of warfare, okay? And it regulates the conduct of hostilities, it regulates the protection of persons in enemy hands, and it regulates weapons issues. I've always personally felt that this was sort of a useful way of approaching this law, because these are distinct baskets of IHL, and there are distinct rules that sort of fall into each of those baskets. And before, I think I'll have time to talk about the conduct of hostilities as in light of the situation in Ukraine and the protection of persons in enemy hands, but I want to say, and I think it's incredibly important to understand, that IHL um, applies equally between the belligerents. In other words, the delimitation between the Adbel, the charter, charter law, and IHL is necessary because, just we know from just general observation, um, states parties who go to war, who execute the first use of force in international relations, they always claim or they believe that the reason for these, this use of force is just. The bottom line is whatever the justness of a war or not under the use of Bello, the application of IHL, the use in Bello, is obligatory. And it binds equally all parties involved in the international armed conflict. That's, a, that's sort of a basic rule of international humanitarian law. And why is this the case? Well, obviously, if the party waging a just war was convinced and there was no IHL restrictions on it, then you know, we would very likely go back to barbarity. IHL, the purpose of humanitarian law is to try to the extent possible, although it's impossible, fully, to humanize war. In other words, to provide protections to persons not, parting, not participating or no longer participating in hostilities, meaning civilian populations, civilians, detainees, and others. Um, and I have to say that um, as an IHL lawyer, and fully understanding the emotional baggage and everything that's going on in Ukraine and the fact that we are talking about an aggression and horrific um, crimes being committed on the territory of Ukraine, that this cannot possibly blind us to looking at the parties equally. And if IHL is to remain credible, this body of law must be applied by both sides in equal measure with respect, regardless of who attacked whom first or any other reasons. So there was a legally, unfortunately, incorrect um, report, for example, of Amnesty International in the be in beginning of August this year, claiming that certain Ukrainian actions against schools and, um, oh, I forget the other thing, never mind, <laughs> um, were not, were not um, in accordance with IHL. I repeat, the analysis was wrong. But the main thrust of enormous criticism at the international level was how dare Amnesty suggest that this party to the conflict is committing any types of violations and that this type of Amnesty report, in fact, you know, um, is grist for the Russian mill. Again, I understand the emotions, I understand everything, but for the purposes of IHL, this law must be um, abided by both sides and Justness of cause makes no difference whatsoever. So, since the February the 24th, as you all know from various sources, um, the media of various kinds, etc., there have been um, enormous, there has been enormous destruction and enormous civilian casualties 
um, on the soil of Ukraine as a result of, of the invasion. We have seen pictures, because I'm speaking, of course, only on, based on public sources of, um, and films on the destruction of houses, hospitals, schools, theaters, religious objects, critical infrastructure, etc. We have also um, learned and continue to learn about the killing of civilians and the execution of civilians. Needless to say, pretty much everything I have um, I have listed may be a war crime. It's not immediately a war crime, but it may be a war crime. In terms of the conduct of hostilities, which is the first basket of rules I want to say something about very briefly, is that the cardinal principle underlying the conduct of hostilities under IHO is the principle of distinction, which means that parties to an armed conflict must at all times distinguish between civilians and combatants on the one hand, and between um, civilian objects and military objectives on the other. So that is the underlying foundation of humanitarian law. Attached to that are three principles, which I won't get into because I, I'll lose you. <laughs> they're too technical and they're too, too detailed. But they're the principle of um, the prohibition of indiscriminate attacks, which if proven at an individual level can be a war crime. Uh, the prohibition of disproportionate attacks, which is also a war crime if proven, and then the obligation of parties um, to take what are known as feasible precautions in attack before launching an attack. Now, under IHL, an attack is use of violence, whether in offense or defense. This is, this is important to know. Another thing that is, I think, important to know is that under humanitarian law, it is not the results of an attack that actually prove its law, uh, that will prove its unlawfulness necessarily. It is what was known to the commander planning and executing the attack at the time he or she decided to do so. In other words, there are tests under each of these three um, rules or principles that need to be conducted to determine, is the object a military objective or is the person being targeted a combatant? Um, was what was eventually uh, fired at, was it actually the target? What was, and because this is a principle people don't often understand, and that's why I'm gonna mention it specifically, is what was the relationship between the military, military advantage expected from the attack and the collateral civilian damage caused. So it's a balancing act that in armed conflict takes place. In other words, IHL tries to do whatever it can to prevent excessive civilian casualties. It doesn't use the word collateral damage, by the way. There is no such term in IHL. But it talks about excessive incidental civilian casualties, damage to civilian objects, or a combination thereof, which constitutes a war crime. But it is a fact that war will produce destruction and it will produce casualties. And there is no way, there is simply no way around it. Only peacetime, unfortunately, can allow um, the avoidance of the type of destruction that armed conflict allows or which occurs. Because IHL is in fact a balance between military necessity and humanity. That's what it is. It's the only body of international law that allows violence against combatants and, and um, military objectives, and then prohibits violence or direct violence, to be very precise, against uh, civilians and civilian objects. But it is based on this balancing act, and um, the rules aim as much as possible, if they are of course respected, to ensure that parties to armed conflicts um, spare the civilians of the civilian population and civilian objects um, to the extent possible. Having said this, it is fairly clear, and reports of various monitoring missions that have been to Ukraine since um, the invasion of the 24th of February have confirmed, without necessarily being able to get into 
whether a specific attack constituted a war crime under the rules of the conduct of hostilities, because this is a complicated, I repeat, it's a complicated legal analysis, that nevertheless, the scale of disruption that has been visited upon objects, civilian objects, and the scale of um, injuries to, to persons and civilian deaths are such that it is pretty safe to conclude that there has been a pattern of disregard for these rules on the conduct of hostilities um, that are provided for in IHL. The OSCE has had two excellent reports um, on, this, on this topic, and um, very recently, on September 27th, the UN Human Rights OHCHR, Office of the High Commission for Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine, also issued a report um, to this effect. One thing that I would like to say, again, because I, I think it's important to understand, is that civilians are protected from attack under humanitarian law, and I quote, unless and for such time as they take a direct part in hostilities. So the general approach of humanitarian law is that civilians should be able to go about their business unencumbered to the extent possible by what is going on. However, if civilians do take a direct part in hostilities, they may be attacked and killed. There's no question about that. And in that context, for example, we have seen, and I again find this somewhat worrying, um, that certain civilians in Ukraine have been passing on direct tactical intelligence information to nearby military forces, allowing those military forces to target Russian positions. Now, that is direct participation in hostilities. There's no question. And so that would be, um, they were there opening themselves up to obvious um, attacks and, of course, to detention and internment in case such civilians are captured. So, again, there are many cases I mean, that I could talk about, but let me sort of leave it at that here. And then IHL also, because this has also been going on, provides for, for a status called specially protected objects. And among specially protected objects are, for example, hospitals. And another type of specially protected objects are nuclear um, power stations, dams, and dikes. These are known as works and installations containing dangerous forces, meaning the release of water, radiation, etc. And under IHL, um, under the additional protocol number one, um, it is provided that even if a nuclear generating power station is a military objective, in other words, the, uh, the hostile party is firing at you from it, it is prohibited to attack it. There are three exceptions um, to the absolute protection under humanitarian law of nuclear power stations, dams, and dikes, but none of those three exceptions are relevant for the scenario that's been going on um, in Ukraine, and therefore I do not intend in particular to talk further about that unless um, there may be questions um, in this sense. One thing to know outside the Ukraine context, or in any context of armed conflict, whether international or non-international, is that the majority of civilian destruction happens because of the use of explosive weapons in densely populated areas. Okay? Um, according to these monitoring reports, which is not surprising because the war is taking place on Ukrainian soil, 90% of destruction of civilian objects has taken place on Ukrainian, government-controlled territory, and 10% um, within the occupied regions. Now, explosive weapons are what? They're artillery, heavy artillery, <laughs> if you like, um, cluster munitions, um, mortars, um, multi-launch, um, multi-barrel um, <coughs> rocket launchers, aircraft bombs, missiles, etc. They are not prohibited by IHL, and in fact, many militaries depend on their use, obviously. The problem has become, of course, with the increased urbanization of every country in the world, if you like, and therefore, increased urbanization of, of warfare. And 
there has been a political um, effort that has been taking place over the last year or so under the leadership of Ireland for states to adopt a so-called political declaration on the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. As the term very clearly says, it's not a legally binding document, doesn't purport to be, it really talks about good practices and how states should cooperate in figuring out how to mitigate <coughs> the effects of, of explosive weapons in populated areas and it will be open to signature on November 18th at a conference in Dublin. At the same time, the ICRC has been, with others of course, leading a project devoted to raising awareness in particular of the effects of the use of heavy weapons with a wide area impact, with a large radius um, in densely populated areas. My prediction is that given, as I said, the urbanization of warfare and the commingling of civilians and combatants, that this, this trend is, will continue. The second aspect I want to talk about um, is the protection of persons in enemy hands. And if the principle of distinction really underlies all of the conduct of hostilities rules, humane treatment is the principle that underlies the protection of persons in enemy hands. So the conduct of hostilities, the use of force, in other words, subject to the rules that I've tried to outline, is, you know, takes place when a, a, a state or a non-state actor or whoever is in fact moving forward and advancing on territory or people with a view to establishing control, which is what happens in war, in armed conflicts. The protection of persons in enemy hands, this basket of rules, deals with, IH, it consists of the IHL rules that must be applied when you already have somebody in your power. Jera is my detainee. <laughs> then I have, no, no, no. Then I have obligations in terms of how to treat um, Jera and the third convention in this respect deals with prisoners of war and the fourth con convention, as I mentioned, deals um, with the protection of civilians. And the purpose of these two conventions, 49, they have a, a total of 450 articles between them, so it's enormous. And they regulate in great detail treatment of prisoners of war, their internment, food, all manner of conditions of detention, um, their release, contacts with families, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the and this is relevant to Ukraine. But what is the essence of prisoner of war status? And who are prisoners of war? Prisoners of war are captured combatants. Who are combatants? They're members of the armed forces of a party to the conflict. Or members of other units who have been incorporated into the armed forces by means of domestic law. They can also be, I'm gonna use this because we're in Serbia and we know the history, they can also be partisan units, meaning voluntary units and militia, provided they fulfill four criteria. They are commanded by a responsible officer, they carry their arms openly, they have distinguishing signs, and they fight in accordance with the laws and customs of war. And so, provided somebody, there are other categories of POWs, but I can't get into that, um, provided somebody falls into one of these two groups, members of armed forces or volunteer um, groups fulfilling the criteria, they must be granted prisoner of war status upon capture. What does this mean? It means that they cannot be prosecuted for directly participating in hostilities. Because as IHL says, war is what? It's the use of violence. Therefore, under humanitarian law, it is very specifically said that combatants have the right to directly participate in hostilities. Therefore, if a POW is captured by the opposing side, he or she cannot be criminally prosecuted for having taken part in hostilities and even killed soldiers of the opposing side because that is lawful. Combatants are military objectives at the end of the day. They can be, however, tried for war crimes. And the third convention specifies a pretty robust regime of fair trial rights 
in case of um, trials of POWs for war crimes. And the principle that underlies all of the POW regime is that is the so-called principle of assimilation, which means that the capturing party, for example, cannot put a POW on trial before a different court and under a different process to the one that it would apply to its own soldiers for the same criminal act. So it, it, there's a sort of, it's, yeah, it underlies all of the convention. And what is happening in Ukraine from the reports I've been reading and, and just generally listening in and following this, is that in fact, with the Russian side, of course, more in terms of numbers of violations uh, for obvious reasons, that both sides have, I would say, failed to respect the convention number three as regards their treatment of prisoners of war. There have been allegations of executions of POWs on both sides, of torture upon capture, um, and then transfer to places of detention on the Russian side even after. Um, you know, d internment um, has, has gone on. There have been allegations of enforced disappearance, of very poor conditions of detention, of denial of the right to POW status, and of unfair trials. And for example, the Russian Federation, from I, it, it's not happened yet, but it was about to happen, is um, allegedly intends to put Ukrainian POWs on trial for, um, first of all, common criminal acts, which are which is prohibited, meaning taking part in hostilities, on the one hand, and seems to have been constructing some sort of special courts for them, with the cages, the famous cages that. Um, are always applied against criminal suspects in, in the Russian Federation, and all of this would clearly be um, a violation of IHO. The monitoring missions have also um, determined that there have been violations of fair trial rights of POWs who have been um, put on trial by the Ukrainian side. Neither side has been terribly good at granting the respective POWs right, the right to family contact. The one good thing so there can be such a thing in this situation is that both sides have granted ICRC access to pr their prisoners of war um, and by the way ICRC under humanity under the third convention has a legal right to visit POWs and detain civilians but it has and the Ukrainian side has granted access to its POWs to other um, to rather human rights monitoring missions but the Russian side has not um, in terms of civilians, the, the reports of violations have been extremely severe. According to the latest OSC report, which is admittedly two months old, even though it didn't come out um, that long ago, um, there are at least 3,000 Ukrainian civilians, I assume, and they always, of course, assume that the number is much larger, um, in Russian hands, in arbitrary detention. There have also been allegations of torture. Um, other ill treatment, extrajudicial executions, and forced disappearances, etc. Um, this is not to say that under humanitarian law, civilians can never be detained. They can be interned as well, if they represent an imperative threat to security. However, under IHL, because it's much harder to know who is a civilian at the end of the day than who is a POW, um, civilians who are interned must be informed of the reasons of their internment. They, their internment must initially be very quickly reviewed, and then it must be periodically reviewed. I have not heard or read from any source that any type of civilian internment that would comply with humanitarian law has been taking place. Primarily, do the civilians who have been detained, which doesn't seem to be the case, fulfill the imperative threat to security, to the security of Russia that they allegedly um, pose. Because we've seen that local officials have been um, detained who are believed to have been pro-Ukrainian, journalists, civil society actors, <coughs> NGOs, and simply ordinary, ordinary civilians. Believe it or not, I am going to end fairly soon. <laughs> I want to just say 
just point to three more things, really in bullet point form, that have been uh, reasons for, for great concern, and but about which we don't know, we don't have sufficient facts because they're happening on either occupied territory in Ukraine or in the territory of Russia itself. The first is the forced conscription of Ukrainian citizen into the Russian or the local Donetsk, Luhansk, etc. armed forces. Um, now, forced serving, compelling a person, whether a POW or a civilian, to, I quote, serve in the forces of a hostile power is a war crime. I don't know the numbers. I haven't read them anywhere, which doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, but if future investigations and you know, reports, et cetera, come out confirming that this indeed has taken place, which already in individual cases has clearly happened, then this would be a very serious um, violation of IHL. Needless to say, um, the situation in, in the occupied areas is complicated because of the dual nationality issue as a matter of law. So who do these people, you know, whose nationals are they in fact? But I'm just flagging this as a, as a legal conundrum that will need to be um, figured out. The second thing that's been going on um, in bullet point form is the forcible deportation of persons from the occupied territories apparently to Russia. Reports talk about hundreds of thousands of people. And again, if this is true, I mean, this also <coughs> obviously constitutes, um, constitutes a war crime. And then the third issue that's been going on, about which we know even less, because it's only sort of anecdotal reports of people who have exited the system, is the mechanism or the system of so-called filtration camps that are going on in, in both the occupied territories and in the territory of Russia itself, which means that persons who are either um, passing through the territory, whether to pick up relatives to bring them back here or there, whatever the case may be, on their way to Russia, on their way to another place in, in one of these regions, are simply stopped for the purposes of security screening. Now, security screening per se is not prohibited. I mean, it's a normal security measure that any state would take under the, under the circumstances to weed out possible competence, et cetera, et cetera. However, um, again, there are no procedural safeguards that anyone that I have been aware of or anyone <coughs> has mentioned thus far, even though the filtration, which takes place in different types of locations and in different types of facilities, may last from a couple of hours, a couple of days, to several weeks. And therefore, the question is, what is the legal basis for this type of, um, for this type of security screening? And I'm not saying, to be honest, that this is a characteristic only of this situation. Whenever civilians move, whether internally or to another country, en masse, um, especially if we're talking about the borders of countries that are at war, um, you will have security screenings, and it's happened in non-international armed conflicts as well. And this is something I would suggest an area, it's not regulated by IHL, um, and then some form of, this is an issue that needs to be addressed simply going forward, because it cannot stay the way, the way it is now. And then within the filtration detention camps, because people are also detained as a result of, if they don't pass the filtration, there have also been, um, there have also been um, allegations of watch this space. Um, my only hope, and I know it's completely illusory, is that the tragedy of Ukraine, and indeed the tragedy of Russia, and the, the consequences for the rest of the world as a result of this, of this armed conflict will lead states, both at the domestic level and at the international level. On the one hand, to become far more aware of the importance of IHL, to actually teach it and train their armed forces in this, and to think of mechanisms at the international or regional level um, at which um, or before which IHL could be better enforced than is the case now. So on that happy note, <laughs> I would like to thank you for your attention, and I am happy to take comments and questions that you may have. Thank you.
thank you, uh, Yelena, for this excellent presentation of the general issues of IHL related to the situation in Ukraine. And I have to commend you for being very disciplined with time. We still have uh, ample time for discussion. Uh, Yelena, of course, will take questions, as she said, and I encourage you to post questions either in Serbian or in English, as you know, which way is more comfortable for you. And uh, I believe that, that Yelena will answer probably in English because that is the, the working language of her professional life, I would say. Um, so the floor is open, please. Imam postavljeno pitanje na srpskom, a naravno vi me govorite na engleskom. Zanima me vaše mišljenje vezano za veliki broj stranih državljena koji se trenutno bore u Ukrajini na ukrajinskoj strani. Neki spominju, odnosno kažu da ih ima možda čak i oko 20.000. E sad, vi me ispravite ako grešim, ali ne sjećam se kada smo od drugog svjetskog rata imali neki oruženi sukob gde je toliki broj stranih državljena se borio za jednu stranu. Za vreme drugog svjetskog rata imali smo različite te legije koje su se borile na strani nacističke Nemačke. Možda je jednako opšte pitanje, ali me zanima vaše mišljenje. As a general rule, a state, any state may incorporate foreigners into its armed forces. Okay? The important thing, my understanding, I don't know the exact numbers of the foreigners that have been involved. They haven't necessarily been incorporated into the armed forces of Ukraine as such, but they have been incorporated into their own units, which are voluntary, and as I mentioned, if they are under responsible command, carry arms openly, um, fight with the, in accordance with the laws of customs of war and distinguish themselves, and are clearly belong to Ukraine in the sense that they're fighting on its behalf, they, there's nothing to prohibit that, actually. So, what IHL tries to, to, to put a stop to, and in fact, um, if you like sanctions, is civilians who are unorganized taking a direct part in hostilities. And as I said, if you do it individually, you may be good. There's nothing to prohibit that under IHL as long as they fulfill the relevant criteria. So from what I know, including the three men who were meant to be tried, there was a death penalty, um, a threat against them, then they were recently released. They were, in fact, um, part of the Ukrainian, um, how can I put it, armed forces, very broadly speaking. Um, having said that, we also need to remember, because it's less written about maybe here, is that Russia has also opened recruitment, recruitment centers for foreigners um, willing to engage on its side and has, as, as we have read in the press, um, promised them facilitated Russian citizenship if they do so. And for a lot of you know, migrant workers whose aim is to go to Russia from the former Soviet republics, you know, this may be an attractive um, way to go. So in fact, both sides are doing it. I, I just don't know the numbers on our, either side. And it's not necessarily unlawful. I hope I've answered your question. First, my regrets that we haven't met uh, at my studies. I was from 1990 to 1994, but obviously computer did not connect us when, when I uh, was about to take my classes in public international law. Uh, the second thing, uh, it's more of a comment, really, uh, to your really meticulous analysis of international humanitarian law. I just wanted to connect to it seems to me that it was a couple of years ago when Jarko Puchowski also had a, a kind of a lecture, a memorial lecture or something which was dedicated uh, to uh, Professor Vojn Dimitrievich and he spoke about uh, the so-called idiotism of human rights. It's a very tricky uh, concept, but under this concept uh, what he meant was kind of a persistent engagement in the protection of human rights regardless of the persons who may receive this protection 
And these may be the persons that we dislike very much in certain circumstances. And uh, my impression was that uh, your uh, lecture or your uh, presentation on international humanitarian law was exactly of that kind, in a sense that it really uh, emphasized that international humanitarian law is probably the core of what uh, Martin Koskiniemi thought of as a gentle civilizer of nations. It is a really gentle civilizer of nation, uh, nations, and in that respect, uh, it has to be applied to any uh, belligerent side, whatever we uh, think of those uh, sides. And unfortunately, we all know that human rights is in an area which can easily be politicized and we can easily slip in, uh, to, towards some sort of a political uh, judgments on, on certain issues, whereas what we heard today was really in the fashion of what was uh, credo of Professor Vojn Dimitrievich, and that was a true professional lawyer's commitment to the topics that uh, he used to cover. And that was my, just uh, a comment that I wanted to share with you and the with the rest of the audience, thanks. <coughs> My question would pertain to what the ICC or all these domestic trials in Ukraine happening at the moment um, are contributing to our uh, um, possible future ICC trials and, and uh, those ongoing in Ukraine. As far as I read, at some point there's like 25 pending cases related to the war crime trials in Ukraine. So my question is uh, general in that respect, how do you, where, where do you see obstacles? And I'm particularly uh, keen of hearing your opinion on this tension. Um, I recognize in um, this um, meticulousness needed for trying uh, a war crime, uh, but at the same time doing what IHL says to do, um, investigate and try as soon as you can, as soon as the circumstances allow. So I see, in a, in, a, in a sense, tension in that, especially having in mind Ukrainian judiciary and everything that I mean, we can imagine they can face at the moment. Thanks. States are the primary um, actors responsible for the implementation of any kind of international law. And the characteristic of international law is it's very decentralized nation. There isn't sort of a silver bullet for better IHL implementation and enforcement. I wish there were, but as we know, there isn't. And states, there's a variety of reasons for which they you know, may not be up to snuff. It can be lack of resources, lack of knowledge, you know, lack of what have you. And it can be lack of political will in, in situations of armed conflict. So one cannot under estimate or overstate rather the importance of states taking IHL serious. In the 20 plus years that I worked at the ICRC, my personal view and, and my experience rather has been that it's states, it's mainly the Western states who take this really seriously. I hate to say that, but it's a fact. Um, they wage wars more than other states, that's also a fact, and therefore they're lawyers and um, tend to know it better. In other regions of the world, um, basic knowledge of humanitarian law is appalling. And so that really does need to change, but there's no particular mechanism for doing this. The ICRC, through its advisory services, does a fantastic job of engaging with states. Um, but as I said, it's, it's multifaceted. The other issue, I would say, there are two other issues at the international level. One is that, yes, there are international courts, the International Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights that have, before which, indeed, Ukraine has instituted proceedings on the 26th immediately and on the 28th of February, like two and four days after the invasion. But as we know, these bodies take a really long time. The proceedings take so long, particularly in front of the ICJ, um, that one, they have an effect, of course. At the end of the day, they will determine responsibility. But the length of time from the occurrence of facts is, is huge. And by the way, the ICJ and the European Court of Human Rights don't determine individual criminal responsibility. 
With the European Court of Human Rights, we are in the very unfortunate situation of the fact that Russia withdrew, or rather was expelled from the Council of Europe. And so Ukrainians' case that was submitted in February, what the court intends to do with all of those cases, it's the 10th Ukrainian case against Russia before the European Court of Human Rights, um, remains to be seen. Russia, even though the withdrawal took place on the 16th of March, or the expulsion, if you like, um, was bound by the convention until the 16th of, of September. So it, the Court of European Court of Human Rights does have a jurisdiction during that period. Once again, you know, Russia's not going to show up, obviously, for those proceedings. But what I do think could happen, actually, and this is, an, this is a whole different can of worms, is the fact that 25 states, from my account that I know as of last night, have decided to intervene before the European Court of Human Rights, meaning as third parties, meaning they don't become parties to the, to the, to the dispute or the suit. They will submit their legal views on legal issues arising from the conflict. I think we'll give this European Court finally a chance to talk about the relationship between IHL and human rights. Because in my personal opinion, I'm, um, I haven't been a great fan of the European Court when it comes to the application of their mandate in situations of armed conflict at all. And so I'm hoping that some of these, that one of the lasting effects at least may be guidance for the future as to how within the European system at least the relationship between IHL and human rights um, works. <coughs> Now, talking about the individual criminal, so in relation to civil responsibility that is not criminal, I don't think a huge amount is going to happen. It is very likely that all these cases are going to come down against Russia. Um, Russia will not take part in the proceedings. And you know the effect of all of these judgments, um, therefore, will remain for some better time if some such time um, occurs eventually. As regards individual criminal responsibility, there are actually several levels that we can talk about. Once again, Ukraine has primary responsibility, and I mean, it's happening on their territory. They have the witnesses, they have the capacity to deal um, with the crimes being committed. And they, they are undertaking whatever they can. My understanding is that there are 20,000 cases of, I don't mean individuals identified, I mean incidents that Ukrainian officials or the prosecution um, has mo ident um, indicated as, as possible war crimes. And they will be the first to <coughs> call. Now, the ICC has opened an investigation. 41 states referred the Ukraine situation to the International Criminal Court. But the International Criminal Court um, has only jurisdiction over war crimes and crimes against humanity and genocide. So it's not going to deal with the act of aggression individual criminal responsibility for, for aggression. Um, I'm not aware that the ICC has opened any you know, cases. They're undertaking the pretrial, or rather, yes, the pretrial of uh, the investigations um, at the moment. Um, the whole thing is going to depend to a large extent, given the complementarity between domestic systems and the ICC, who is going to come before the ICC eventually. You know, and I have to say, unfortunately, in May, the Russia, um, the Ukrainian um, legislation was passed related uh, a law on cooperation with the ICC, which didn't exist until now. And the law says that it's only acts, crimes against Ukrainian nationals that can be that can be looked into, you know, as a matter of complementarity. So that again decredibilizes IHL, which is what I was trying to say. Um, so, question mark what the ICC will do, who it will have a chance to, you know, identify and, and prosecute before the ICC, leaving aside the whole issue of how defendants will come before it. And then the thing that's most being talked about today, although I personally think it's a red herring at some level, is the issue of how to bring uh, President Putin and other leaders before some sort of tribunal that would be set up for the crime of aggression. The International Criminal Court, because neither Russia nor Ukraine are formally parties, Ukraine submitted a declaration to the ICC on the basis of which the prosecutor is acting on its soil, but is not a party to the ICC statute, 
Um, the question is going to be, the, the question has been posed, how about the crime of aggression, which is also included in the ICC statute. So there's a, a range of mechanisms being discussed. Um, two seem more, most prominent at the moment. The first is so, sort of special tribunal to be set up by willing states um, along the model of the Nuremberg Tribunal. I don't think that's going to work because at the end of the day it's limited to a small number of countries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there has been more prominently the idea of setting up a court that would be um, set up between the UN and Ukraine for the crime of aggression on the recommendation of the General Assembly. And it would require Ukraine to adopt a constitutional law and then um, and then the treaty for such a tribunal prior to that to be included in the UN-Ukraine agreement. Um, it remains to be seen. I mean, this is hugely being discussed. Once again, the effects of any of this will depend, first of all, on whether somebody travels abroad, which if I were a Russian official, I would no longer do today. Um, and it also depends on whether there is one day regime change in Russia. You know, we've had it happen in this country where somebody, <laughs> president, the former president was handed over. So, you know, but to try and answer your question, this is a really long-winded way of doing it, is to say that mm, for the moment, I don't think anything radical is going to happen. As long as they stay in Russia, as long as there is no regime change, I can't see any Russians being coming either before, you know, Ukrainian courts from Russia, or to the tribunal or otherwise. I mean, that is simply that is simply the problem. So despite the flurry of activity, as usual, it will be legally very important. At the moment, at least, and I have to say really only at the moment, because I can't predict the future, the practical effects are not going to be too great. That, that's my sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Professor Sh uh, Sh Vucquiz, Sh Vucquiz. Very insightful. Uh, just a brief follow-up question to what you mentioned about dissemination of knowledge and information, IHL uh, versus uh, international law and human rights. Uh, uh, what is your feeling? Because my feeling after so many years uh, of work in this country is that uh, that even if we had uh, some knowledge on international law and human rights, uh, of human rights, uh, the town no knowledge in uh, IHL is quite limited, limited to a very small group of people and uh, to some uh, very vague ideas about you know, how to treat prisoners, what to do. Uh, I don't know to which extent uh, we even learn about it in schools, you know, because we do it. Uh, in, in the law school, mm. but human rights, you know, it's been taught as part of different topics. So, mm. uh, why why is that? Is it true that actually human rights law is more known in most of the countries? Mm -hmm. And why is that so? Is it due to the ICRC that actually should get more involved? Is it due to the army systems mm -hmm. or our education systems? Mm -hmm. And since it's so interrelated. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. That's a great question. I think there are two reasons for this. I mean, IHL is a specialized body of law, military force, etc. It's not everyone's cup of tea. You know, that, that's, that's a given. And then many countries that are not involved in war don't have a huge interest, you know, in developing their IHL knowledge, dissemination, etc. Although they should under the treaties. But there are two really important reasons. I think why it's so much so less known. One is that um, for the human rights treaties or human rights in general, Nevin, I can't see me, <laughs> is that um, there's a whole infrastructure of human rights implementation. And I know you know this better than anyone. <laughs> At one level, you have the committees that are attached to every international human rights treaties. You have the Human Rights Council, which is you know, a political organ, but then engages in universal periodic review with states, et cetera, and has a range of functions in, in the human rights domain. And then thirdly, we have courts, regional, European, regional rather. Um, and so there's everything on the planet that you could possibly think 
And I'm really glad you asked this question because it allows me to say things, something that, again, is not terribly well known, which is that humanitarian law is the only body of international law practically, especially dealing with people, with the protection of persons that does not have any type of infrastructure attached to it. It doesn't even have an assembly of states parties that would meet, say, annually to discuss implementation, exchange practices, etc. Nothing of that kind. Um, in 2011, the Swiss government and the ICRC undertook an eight-year project, which I was head of, um, to try and see whether there could be an appetite among states to create a state party mechanism to which you can then attach reporting procedures, thematic discussions, investigation, you know, et cetera. It, it spectacularly failed. It took eight years of my life, um, among other things, and it spectacularly failed. There was absolutely no political willingness by states to create such, such, a, such an architecture um, for IHL. And then the <coughs> second reason I think IHL is far less known than human rights. Why? IHL is far less, sorry, far less known than human rights um, is the fact that it involves armed conflict. You know, it's a really, it's an awful business. There's, there's no question about it. And so NGOs and civil societies stay away. They don't want to get involved because their sense is that, you know, the very fact that you can have lawful civilian casualties in war, you know, or destruction of civilian objects, it puts them off. And the whole idea of human rights is something entirely different. And so there isn't this a civil society, NGO, you know, and other public pressure <coughs> push to make IHL more known and more visible. And, and, and I think that will remain a problem. Um, having said that, it is also, and this is what I get distressed about, is that when human rights bodies do get engaged with IHL, they know it rather poorly, you know? And then they tend to adopt human rights interpretations of certain concepts, terms, etc., which just make it a pie in the sky. And that also needs to be avoided. Um, which is why I mentioned that I'm hoping that the interventions of these 25 countries before the European Court of Human Rights in the latest Ukrainian case will give them a chance to talk about the relationship between IHL and human rights. Because if IHL becomes unworkable for militaries, they're not gonna, they won't apply it. And as I said at the beginning, it is a balance between military necessity and humanity. And military necessity means what it means. You know, so it's a very different logic. And um, so, yeah, those would be my thoughts on your lovely question. As we've seen lots of reports on proxy war being waged, you know, weapons being sold to Ukraine and to a lesser extent to Russia, what sorts of issues does this raise under international humanitarian law for those companies especially? I mean, as a track record, I know, it's a quick question, if you have two minutes. Uh, as a track record of sort of war crimes, you know, um, continues to mount and we see, um, you know, the foreseeability that these weapons will be used for illegal purposes, essentially. How does that reflect? And what prospects of liability do you see when it comes to, to those companies especially? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Which is the use of private military and security companies. Am I correct? And arms companies. Sorry? And arms companies as well. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so their regulation under international law is rather sketchy. That, I mean, that's just, you know, this is better than I do if you work uh, on this area. Um, we have something called the Montreux document that was developed by the ICRC and the Swiss government on good practices for private military and security companies. But the phenomenon is so widespread, you know, it, it's just completely exploded. Um, the, this, apart from the urbanization of warfare, the civilianization of warfare as evidenced by the continued and increasing use of PMSCs um, is another sort of fairly recent trend in, in armed conflict. Um, states, it's a very complicated legal relationship between the home state, the territorial state, and the contracting state. My very brief and by no means meticulous <laughs> sense of things is there 
isn't sufficient accountability under domestic law for the actions of these, of these companies. So, in armed conflict, they can be incorporated into the armed forces. They can be at the. They can also be. Um, they can also be groups that belong to a party to the conflict. In which case, their members would be POWs. But this is extremely rare, almost unheard of. In international armed conflict, they could be protected as prisoners of war um, because they are civilians accompanying the armed forces. But the vast majority of companies, based on the actual mandate that they have and the work that they perform will be will be civilians. Therefore, they don't have a right to participate in hostilities. You know, they can be targeted if they do, and the great majority of them do not. However, as the Iraq situation and other um, contexts have shown, the US did actually adopt a law recently or fairly recently to try and fill the gap of lack of accountability for PMSCs and its domestic legislation. But a lot more needs to be done. And at the moment, as I assume you know, there is also the working group, UN working group on mercenaries has has been debating um, a the completion of a draft convention on the use of PMSCs um, more broadly, including in situations of armed conflict. Where that process goes and what it says, I honestly do not know at this point. And then the second question that can also be um, come out of, of this, but I won't, I won't explain it because I know people are tired and they want to go to the cocktail, is the issue of co-belligerency. You know, are countries that are taking part, I mean, that are taking part, are countries that are supporting Ukraine in various ways, indeed parties to this conflict, are they co-belligerents or not? You and I can possibly talk about that over a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Yelena. and for great and insightful answers to the also great um, questions from the audience.